White Dwarf celebrates 47 years and approximately 500 issues. We get a little more clarification on what the stilling is in the Pariah Nexus, a massive 36-page battle report, and lots of love for Grombrindle, the White Dwarf himself, here in issue 500. Hello, I'm Miranda, and thank you for joining me for this review. Jumping right into our letter from the editor, Lyle. Hi, Lyle. Talks about how White Dwarf wasn't actually always numbered. It had gone from being numbered to kind of not being numbered, and then having a weekly se segment for a period of time, and then back to monthly. And so there was a bit of a controversy on getting numbers back onto the magazine, and they sort of settled with resuming back at, I believe, 450. Um, and so here we are at issue 500, although one might argue that it could be a little higher, but this seems like a reasonable number to start. So this month's issue comes with a bunch of loose inserts. So jumping right in, the 40K scenario for this month is called Siege Break, which is another moving objectives game. And the battle plan for Age of Sigmar is the Battle of Glim's Forge. There's also this sweet little munchkin card that you can uh, add to your munchkin game to give you a little, little advantage there. And these little cards here for the character of Grombrindle, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Oh yeah, and a code for buying even more stuff from the White Dwarf store. The star letter for this month on the contact page comes from Christian out of the UK, and he talks about what got him into Warhammer. And it turns out, as I mentioned oftentimes, it is, in fact, the community and the people. Of course, the models are super fun. Everyone likes some good lore. You know, if you enjoy the gameplay and the hobbying, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, wargaming is a social hobby, and the people really can make or break that hobby for you. So I do appreciate that he highlights how the community around him has really been what has kept him involved in playing the game. Even if you don't always feel like it, just having a place to go at the game store can be just so nice for your stability and having a cool routine and, you know, that whole third place thing. In fact, on the contact page, there are lots of letters reflecting fondly on people's time collecting White Dwarf, going back to sometimes issues less than 100, really, really old issues of White Dwarf and how long they've been collecting or, you know, they, they had some issues as a kid and then got away from it for a while and then came back later. Hopping on over to the Bunker portion of the magazine, uh, Lyle talks about how the Crusade campaign for the Bunker has ended, resulting in a draw, although the details of which are kind of interesting. If you watch the last couple issues, you know, it was getting very one-sided anyway. Um, and how the White Dwarf team are now working on painting up armies for armies on parade. And if that is something that you want to do, then this month's issue also includes a little like planner that you can reference if you are planning to or interested in building your own army on parade. And the main challenge is to paint monsters and machines. The next article is a Warhammer Underworlds feature called Divine Intervention in which Grom Brindle himself can interject himself into your Underworld games. It references the inserts mentioned earlier, so there's four different inserts you can use, one for each grand alliance that you're a part of. You pay a certain amount of glory points to play that card, and there's a whole rule for how it gets shuffled into your deck, and then you can have that miracle take place in your game. This little dwarf shows up a lot in this issue. All right, as always, one of my favorite articles, basic training, and this time we're talking about fighting. Well, the fight phase, anyway. Steven discusses the specific strategies for getting the most out of your fight phase. Even if you aren't, you know, super amazing in combat, and he talks about how you can utilize things like piling in in a coordinated fashion to get the best benefit and maybe even get a double movement of sorts uh, if you can clear out the enemy and consolidate toward an objective. Utilizing the fight phase pile in to get either the best line of sight or block the opponent's line of sight. Making use of the epic challenge stratagem, which gives you the precision keyword, which then allows you to target character models. And finally, understanding how to capitalize or minimize the fight's first ability. 
So these articles are always really helpful because it gives you specific picture examples that you can look at that help you to remember other things like if you need to be in base-to-base -base contact with your enemies so that the models, the rest of the models in your unit can get into base-to-base -base contact with you so that you can be close enough to an enemy for all the models to attack. Um, how you can get tied up or how you can tie up your enemy to prevent them from being able to pile in on your unit. And of course, just generally remembering to use your stratagems, which is typically a failure point of mine. And then there's always a quiz of sorts at the end of the article in called Order, Sir, in which they lay out a scenario and ask how you would approach that. At the end of the magazine, there's several different approaches and then what they suggest is the best one. On the hobby hangout side, Dan talks about the joys of dry brushing. Honestly, dry brushing is generally amazing for being able to bring up details on models with lots of details because it's just a highlighting function largely. Uh, last issues, more talking about painting and, and utilizing just all over painting techniques, whereas this is like all over dry brushing techniques. And he does a lovely job on a Rogaldorn here. The next article is called The Nephilim Anomaly, Xenos Activities. And really it is about how these different alien races are profiting on war in the Nephilim sector, which is the part of the galaxy that is affected by the Pariah Nexus which has an effect known as the stilling on all of the worlds within it. That is my understanding. And the different races, you know, are affected slightly differently and they cope with, or, you know, the Eldari, for example, are affected by the stilling even more dramatically than even humans. And from what I gather, the stilling itself is almost like losing your will to do anything, including live. So, over time, this just malaise in the air, the whatever the effect is that the Necrons caused has the effect of humans just giving up or any life forms on there just giving up on everything and just not even fighting. And so there's really not much of a resistance for the Necron forces coming into these worlds and taking over and the Eldari are more dramatically affected by it because I guess because of their link to like the Immaterium. Um, the orcs are also kind of affected by it in that, you know, if they want to have a wall, then they can't, they can't get up enough energy because the opponents and everyone they're fighting just has no like will to, to fight. And so it just kind of takes all the fun out of it for them. So they sort of lose some of that energy. And apparently the stilling has a countering effect on the, the magical energy of a wa, but those sneaky little like mech boy tech boys started playing around with a bunch of technology and learned that that blackstone stuff has a countering effect. So they're back to wine and everybody's happy in the orc world. Um, the dark Eldari, the Drukhari, uh, they are super affected because part of how they keep Slaanesh at bay is by um, feasting on like the pain and suffering and, and torture of others. So, you know, that's nice. Uh, but because the stilling has such a de dis debilitating effect on individuals, like they're not even getting any like satisfaction of it. People are just like letting themselves die. So that's really bad for them. So it kind of talks about that and gave me a little bit more insight onto what the stilling effect actually is. And I don't know how long this is going to last if the Nephilim sector is just like just not even worth dealing with. I don't know, can you exterminatus an entire sector? I'm not sure, but I was happy to at least have some idea of what that is, especially since the Pariah Nexus is going to be the new mission pack for this year. Then we jump on over to part two of Tempest Pergatus. Uh, this is continuing from the Admech story where we're on the Admech ship that gets pulled out of warp space by the Necrons doing some timey wimey magical nonsense. Um, and now we pick up the story from the Necron side. So, you know, you're kind of getting both sides of it. Basically, there is an object on this ship that the Admech is carrying and the Necrons want it. Uh, and it's really, really powerful. And unfortunately for the Necrons, the Admech actually have some idea how to use it as a weapon. 
but that story does introduce us to some new boarding actions. The Spatial Anomaly boarding actions has missions that result in your board layouts getting rotated. So effectively your units are possibly translocating every turn starting I think with turn two or after turn two. And so the, the battlefield shifts around and so it's going to make it a lot more complicated to do your boarding actions or maybe way more convenient. Who knows, sometimes that works out in your favor. Then a lovely faction focus on my new favorite chapter of well, Ultramarines essentially, but Marine, Space Marines, uh, the Tome Keepers. There's a little faction focus here on developing your own chapter, how to kind of come up with the names and the backstories and, and all of that. Plus a lovely, lovely gallery of the Tome Keepers. And I'm just, just so excited to get my little faction started. All right, next up we've got this massive narrative, 36 page battle report complete with digital paintovers, which was something I didn't realize was a thing until now. It's called the Invasion of Samarcus, and it is uh, gene stealer cults plus Tyranids versus Tome Keepers allied with Votan. So it's a massive, it's eight player game over three huge tables. Uh, and I don't know how long it took them to record this, but it's very narratively told. It's wonderfully done and they enlisted the help of Scott Says, I'm saying that right, who did these digital paint overs where you take an image of a miniature and then you do these, well, digital painting layovers in like Photoshop or I think he used Procreate in this case to enhance the model to give it this comic book feel. You try not to take away the fact that there's a model there but it does enhance and you know you're adding like gunfire and atmosphere and like lighting effects to it which just make it really really cool so this 36 pages that you're following is a full-on narrative with pictures you're kind of reading a comic you're kind of reading the story it's really fun and once that battle is over they actually give you the rules for if you want to play the Battle of Samarcus. Now it covers both Kill Team, Warhammer 40K, and boarding actions. So it's actually like, it spans three different games to complete their campaign. But the rules are in here if that's something that you or your gaming club want to try. Then they have a little focus article on Scott Says, who actually describes the process of doing the digital painting um, overlay and also giving you tips and information on if you want to try doing it yourself. Like, it's not necessarily a hard process, but you know, there are some details that you want to pay attention to. So if you are into that and you want to get some cool, I don't know, glamour shots of your miniatures or some really like fantastic uh, shots you got in the middle of one of your battles and you want to bam it up a notch, then uh, he kind of tells you how to do it. All right, the next one up is a 500 Dwarf Legacy. So this article obviously talks about the entire timeline of White Dwarf back when it was a little zine called like Owl and Weasel. And then finally into White Dwarf, which was just like this hobby magazine that talked about all kinds of board gaming and, and the hobby itself, not just their products, to the introduction of Citadel miniatures. And then obviously finally into like White Dwarf being what it is today, which, you know, is massively, I mean, obviously just GW focused, but also this really huge magazine that's normally 144 pages. I think it originally started off as like 25 pages. So it gives you an idea of how far it's come along, you know, over like almost five decades. Um, but very cool to see. They highlighted select covers, I should say, of, of the magazine history because they're not gonna be able to list all 500. Although, if you do wanna see all 500 covers, I forgot to mention that one of the many inserts with the magazine includes a double-sided poster, which includes all 500 covers squished up into a full magazine but you can kind of make out what they all look like, so that's really cool. In fact, if you have these issues, you can probably find them on here. And on the other side, you get the White Dwarf himself, Mr. Grombrindle, beautifully painted by Johan Grunier uh, in a full, I believe, oil painting, so fantastic job there. And so, you know, you have to decide which, which side of the poster do you want. And there are some standout issues in here 
like really early on in 1984 when Andrew Lloyd Webber is photographed playing with um, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone. Like whoever owns issue 71 gets the benefit of having a full wool knit pattern. I don't know why, but that's kind of awesome. Um, you have the announcement of 40K Rogue Trader starting. Issue 132, they had a cardboard Bane blade for assembly. How cool is that? And it happened to be kind of a fun coincidence that some of these standout issues that they mention in this issue happen to be issues that I have access to. <laughs> One of them mentioned is White Dwarf issue 136, where they have templates in here which reference building and cutting out little cardboard orc vehicles like the Lung Burster and the Brain Smasher. So that's an issue that I have that made me really happy. I, I hope that these items are still tournament legal because, you know, technically it is an official thing. Also a little funny note because they're going over obviously the British magazines. Issue 211 from July of 20, I'm sorry, July of 1997, also an issue I have access to, but it's the American one. The, I don't know, whatever that, that burst mark here is, where in the, mag, in, the, in the White Dwarf 500 it says, 211, it's a stoter, which if you look up on Google, I, I have no idea what that is. There's like 11 different definitions for it. And America knew better, and so we just said, it's a scorcher. So, <laughs> so you know, that, I think that's what that translates to. And popping right on over to issue 212, the introduction of the Sisters of Battle with codex, like a little codex in here, and miniatures that, well, frankly, we used for 20 years. We also have issue 214 with White Orc, uh, so featuring Gorka Morka, fun times. And we also have issue 215 featuring the Bretonians. So I was excited to see that all of these mentioned in the timeline, like we had like five of those issues. We actually have more of those issues too, but they weren't mentioned in here. And out of curiosity, if you haven't already posted, I am curious, what is the earliest issue of White Dwarf that you still own? Apparently for us, it's 136. It is a super fun retrospective. It's cool to see them reference back to like issue August of 1999, where they had extracts from uh, the first Gaunt's Ghost book, first and only, and I guess also Troll Slayer that same year. 1999 is apparently quite a good year for media, <laughs> movies and books. There was a short time in which some magazine called Fanatic was also being put out. I never knew about that. I don't know if you guys ever collected that one. And so it is interesting to see the timeline as it comes to, you know, more recent history where I was getting into them. And I guess over the last few years, I've had on and off like purchases of the magazine, but it would be very, you know, sporadic. It would just be based on like if there was a particular article of interest to me. Um, but then my actual reviews really started with issue 488. So it's, you know, pretty recent history for me getting into White Dwarf, but I mean, some people apparently have been collecting it nearly the entire run of the magazine, which is really impressive. Then they did a really fun thing. The next article is called The Cover Feature, in which they asked all of the heavy metal artists to put together miniature dioramas that would then be photographed to be White Dwarf covers. So they would take how the diorama turned out and decide what might be the best cover style, whether it be the more old school White Dwarf font or what kind of background they would go with for the miniature, uh, for the diorama rather. And the, the way they turned out was actually really, really cool. And, they, and each of the artists, of course, talks about how they painted each of these. So again, wonderful job. Absolutely worth looking at from a gallery perspective. And a special favorite of mine is Kieran's Royal Standard with the Bretonian Pegasus, and uh, I believe what Suggs would call a little guy on the on the diorama, who who got a spotlight photo, and it was completely worth it. I'm pretty sure this is the same model I saw for the new Old World stuff in the game store just earlier today, and man, I was really tempted. Like, I don't know that I have the energy to start Old World, but it's really hard to turn down a Pegasus.
The next article is called The Legend of the White Dwarf, and it is, I guess, kind of an origin story uh, of Grom Brindle and where he comes from. He had a different name, like Snorri Whitebeard. So I understand why he went with the new name, um, but you know, he, he was a Dorden of, of renown and legend, and he was reincarnated, and now he's god, demigod, something like that. He kind of just comes in and out of battles as he pleases and, and can change the fate of things at his will. He, he seems a bit mercurial, but um, also mostly helpful. And that kind of lore tends to work out really perfectly because Grom Brindle actually has playable rules for Age of Sigmar and Underworlds and Warcry and Cursed City but ironically enough, not Old World. So as part of the inserts, there are actual cards and character sheets for him in each of those different other game formats. And so it would also make sense for them to also have a miniature for him. And so, yes, they do. The brand new Grom Brindle miniature has come out uh, and is available at the same time as the White Dwarf magazine, so if you wanna get your hands on him, I'm sure he's limited edition. And you might already have this model in some iteration, because apparently this is the 17th resculpt of Grom Brindle. And don't get me wrong, he looks super cool, but, you know, you might already have just another version of him. So I'm sure technically any version of Grom Brindle you have would work for your Warcry, Undercity, Cursed City, and Age of Sigmar games. <laughs> But I will say, if you are looking at getting this one, he is just on a single sprue. The base is all molded in. He gets to stand atop trophies of his enemies, axe held aloft, uh, no tactical rock. He's just standing on one as though it's a stage. So uh, it is nicely done. And there is an entire painting guide in here for painting him up, uh, especially getting that beard just right because obviously that's a bit of his calling card. So continuing on with our favorite little white dwarf, another article from Steven uh, called The White Dwarf talks about the actual sculpting of him where he mentions that there has been 17 iterations of Grom Brindle. And there's little details where, you know, this particular sculpt harkens back to older versions of him as sort of an homage to the older sculpts. Then we get some Age of Sigmar lore. There's a little snippet story in here called Shards of Divinity that has to do with the coming of Morai Heg. So hopefully those of you who play Age Sigmar know what I'm talking about. I found the story kind of confusing myself. Then hopping on to a tale of four gamers, I mean a tale of four warlords, uh, and the year has concluded for this particular segment of those warlords, and there's sort of the final army shots in here. So Jake, with his Slaves to Darkness, has painted up Bellacor as one of his final pieces. Uh, Sebastian jumped into a third faction by painting up a bunch of orcs. Flora went way out of left field, which I super appreciate, and painted up a whole dang church. Really good terrain pieces always stand out, it's just remarkable. And then Chris, with his Gloom Spike Gits, painted up a Gargant and a Chargoth to help round out and finish his full army. And they were clearly very productive over the year, painting up a total of around 368 miniatures. And lastly, we've got our Black Library segment, normally one of my favorite ones. This one was okay. I mean, it's also another Grom Brindle story. It just takes place in Age of Sigmar, obviously. And uh, there's some, some orc, Grots attacking some Dorden, some, uh, some dwarves, and Grom Brindle's gonna come in and change the tide of battle, and, and, and that's really the story. So this whole issue obviously has been very focused on Grom Brindle and his intervention in parts of the world, let's say. Cool, all right, and that's it. That concludes the 192 page issue 500 of White Dwarf. If you are a fan of Grom Brindle and you want to learn a lot about that, I would definitely recommend this because you're going to get a ton of lore about that. Um, otherwise, you know, you get a lot of the normal stuff. I always recommend the basic training because it's just full of useful information. Uh, I don't know if you had a favorite article in here. If you do, definitely let me know in the comments. I still want to know what your earliest issue of White Dwarf was because I mean, 47 years is a long time, and I know some of you may have had issues when you were kids, 
and then weren't allowed to keep them. So you may have at one point had even older issues and weren't able to like hold on to them. Uh, so my, my condolences if that happened to you. And um, before signing off, I did want to ask you guys if you are interested in seeing a superfluous review on some of these older white dwarf issues like 136 or 212, please let me know in the comments because this is a bit of work to do these and I'm happy to do them if there's interest, but I need you all to let me know if that's something you want. Um, don't forget to leave a like on, the com on this video also. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time.